we all set? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a town of Andover special town meeting for Thursday, August 1st. The electors and citizens qualified to vote in town meetings in the town of Andover are hereby notified that a special town meeting will be held in the town office building community room and our first order of business is to choose a moderator for said meeting. Any, any nominations? Nominate Wally. Nominate Wally. Do we have a second for Nominate Wally? Second only there, Bob Hamburger. All right, so Don Denley, nominated. All those in favor? Uh, any other nominate? Uh, good. Wally, all yours. Item number two is to give the town will approve the receipt of the grant of $83,000 for the fiscal year 2024 2025 from the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. Recreational Trails Program requiring a town match of $21,000 from the town multi-use building fund to fund the design of a pathway between the municipal complex and the House River Trail through town-owned land. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Eric Anderson for presentation on it. All right, folks, can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, so we're going to, Jeff says I have four minutes to do this. So I will go quickly, but probably take more than four. Okay, so our chart requires us to go to a special meeting anytime we as a town accept a grant. That's the grant is more than $2,500, and there's any town contribution, even public works doing a little work work. Um, it has to go to town meeting, so that's what we're here for. So I applied for a DP rec trails grant. This spring, the goal of this was to design an improved Percy Cook Trail. So uh, we, as many of you know, we, last year we got a legislative appropriation of $100,000 to figure out where the trails should go and how it should work here. Um, so out of that came a desire for two pathways. One going down Route 316 and connecting to the rail trail, and the second one going through town property, which combined make about a two mile loop. So uh, we've tried to fund both of them with different mechanisms. We went through a program called LOTSIP to fund the pathway down Route 316. We did get a $2.9 million LOTSIP grant for the construction of that. And that is in final design right now. In fact, you might have seen the guys surveying on Route 316. Still going to be a few years out. Still a lot more outreach to the homeowners that needs to happen. Finalized design, work with DOT, back to the homeowners. So it's not happening instantaneously. The second half of this was a pathway that runs back through town property and also connects to the trail. So we applied to DEP. Uh, for the design funding. And the reason I did that was in, in the last four or five funding segments, DEP has been much more likely to fund design studies and then a year or two later fund construction. So that's the road we took with that. This is the fourth time I've applied to this program for funding and the first time we got it. So DEP has committed $83,500 for the design. The town matches $21,000, which will come from the multi-use building fund. So it won't be additional taxation. It's money we've already put away uh, you know, for construction projects. So this is just kind of a summary of that for the Mercy Cook Trail. The study, we completed the initial study using 100% legislative grant funding. Um, now we have the design permitting, uh, you know, and so we're funding that 80% with state rec trails grant and 20% from the town. Um, we're looking to get the study going sometime middle to end of August. We've already gone to RFP for the contractor that's, or the engineering firm that's doing the design for both this part and this part. So we don't need to re-go out to RFP. And the location is the area between here and the Hop River Trail. I'll show you mapping in a second. So here's a breakdown of the cost estimate. The top part is everything we're doing now. 
Um, so the bottom half is just a real, you know, one over the world estimate for the actual construction. So this would be, if it ever got actually built, would be somewhere around a million dollar project. Um, and obviously we're not going to do that unless we have that funded. So uh, this is the overall plan. Let me zoom in on that. This is what we're talking about. So here, we're in the lower corner where it says community center. And the red line is the existing outline of the Percy Cook Trail, which follows the old logging trail for the last time that property got logged. The problem is, if you see all those little lines up there, that's really steep contour. So the town hall is about 380 feet in elevation. It rises up to about 490 feet, and then it drops back down to about 330 feet. So there's a lot of up and a lot of down there. So the hard part has been coming up with the design which gets down below the 10% grade level so that it's actually walkable and bikeable. Um, and, you know, it meets current, uh, you know, so we've done an initial look at this using LIDAR data uh, in the existing mapping that the town has. And the next stage is to go back there and to survey it, you know, do core samples of the earth so you know what you're looking at and design the actual pathway. So that's what this grant is designed to do, is get us up to a final design to how they make that route uh, go through, and if we go back one slide, you can see in green that is roughly the path that will be taken by the uh, second trail that will run down Route 316. So you can see from where we are here that gives you roughly a two foot, two mile loop trail from this location um, where you don't have to worry about cars other than a little bit on uh, Cider Mill Road. Uh, so that is basically what we're applying to do, um, and obviously it takes a town meeting to approve that funding. So at this point, I know I went through that pretty quick, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you all have. This is funding up against the school property. What is this right at okay. the top of that trail? Um, so the top of the trail will run roughly. It will stay on. It will stay off the parcel that's quote unquote school property, but it will run fairly close to it. Yes. So is there any extent of, uh, well, what is the school board set on this sort of administrative superintendent? I haven't asked. Yeah, but I have So the, Pers the Percy Cook is the one that goes off the back side of the school. It's not the one that goes down 316, your other thing? Correct, correct. The Percy Cook is the one that goes back through. Which color is it? So the red. it's the red going to the purple. <laughs> the purple is the revised, the red is the existing trail. The purple is what you have to do if you want to make it great and make it something that's, you know, walkable. If any of you have walked up that from the rail trail, you'll notice that's an extremely tough walk uh, to make you know, and impossible on a bike of any sort. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Uh, and the question here is, will this design study include what I might call a cost-benefit analysis? You were talking about a project on the order of one mill, and I'd like to have some estimates about uh, you know, how many users uh, on a daily, monthly, seasonal basis. Uh, you know. And I would hope that that would be part of the uh, design process to get that information as part of the public uh, outreach. Second question is what provision for public input in the design of process is envisioned? So one of the things that is an absolute requirement for DEP funding is public engagement. So there will be a, multiple meetings on this and a public hearing on this prior to coming up with a final design. <coughs> Don? Yeah, Don Lynn, Lynn, Drive. So the red, is, is that currently a trail or is that just a proposed trail? Well, it's, it's a, a, a wooded in. It's a trail that we keep walkable. 
Okay, and it's it's marginally marked mountain bikeable until you get to the steep section. Now, that's not really rideable from you know the last uh, third of a mile. Basically, is is not really rideable. It's marginally walkable, um, but not rideable in its current state. It was the old logging road for when they logged this property. So that's there now. So if we um, the hundred thousand dollars goes to fund the design for the, the purple area or the blue. Well, but there's also, if you see the light blue, those are those are areas that are wetlands. So there's gonna to have to be some provision. When you're logging a road, you can be less sensitive to wetlands than you have to be if you're putting a permanent trail. So there's a bunch of design in the other spots and there will also be a fair bit of design when we get up into this area, because part of the, the issue we ran into is we developed a secondary path to get to the Percy Cook Trail from here, so we could prevent people from having to cross school property when the Percy <coughs> Cook Trail was originally developed, which is going back maybe eight or nine years. And one of the issues that we had with that is that this section, especially in years like this, is extremely wet. So even though we have permission from the gas line to cross in a secondary spot, that would this part here would need to be improved too, because there is some some definite wetlands crossings and wetlands impacts there. So that's a big part of the the fairly big wetlands design component to this. To the design parts. So you're saying the project itself over if it were came off the ground it would be over a million dollars. Uh, if we paved the whole thing, yes. But you know, any one-mile paving project these days is, you know, true. So, so, oh, so you said nine hundred fifty thousand may be required for construction. Is the current estimate? Was that yeah. paving? So you said maybe about two years from now we might be able to apply for grant money. Is that right? Sure. And is that going to also require about a 20-25% contribution from the town? So it depends. I mean, my goal would be another lots of grant. Part of the reason why I've done it this way is, it, and the reason why we went after a legislative grant in the first place is it's often harder to get design money than it is to get actual construction money. Once you've got essentially what they call a shovel-ready project, where you have an engineering design that, you know, the especially the DOT has blessed, it is easier then to actually fund the construction. So, which is exactly what we did in 316. We went after congressional for legislative money first, used the legislative money for a study in preliminary design, went applied the lots of, got the lots of funding um, in the first go around, which was pretty cool. And um, so that project, you know, Small Town may have $20,000, $30,000 of skin in the game by the time we develop it, but the state will have about $3 million. So we funded almost the whole cost of this. My goal is to do the same thing with this, but I can't guarantee it. And obviously, if I'm standing up here in a couple of years asking you for $200,000, that's a much bigger ask for the town, and I recognize that. Um, Will lots of fund something up to that amount, Eric? Yeah. Okay. The, the only, my only hesitation with LOTSIP is that uh, right now the pipeline for lots of funding is filled mm -hmm. out at least another five or six years. Mm -hmm. So I don't know when they're going to have another LOTSIP grant funding round available to us. Um, so okay. that's kind of where I'm going with it. I realize it hasn't been entirely designed. Carrie Crawford, uh, I'm sure. sure Peter Rowe, hasn't been entirely designed. Like what's the width you're envisioning? You know, like two people walking abreast? Yeah, this will likely be a 10 foot. I mean, kind of the, the DOT, federal DOT standard for multi multi use paths is a 10 foot wide path. And the cabin. Say again? And you're planning on pavement for the cabin or something? Um, so. The steep part will absolutely be paved. The rest of it could be stone dust and it could be paved. It's gonna kind of depend on what people want. 
I don't have any pre, I like riding gravel, so I'd be just as happy making it stone dust. But there is more erosion, you know, maintenance costs are slightly higher with gravel than with pavement. Hi, Doris Pompadano, 33 Second Old Road. As a person born with disabilities, and it's going to be crossing in front of my house um, and my children's house, uh, I'm concerned about the three foot uh, that you mentioned um, that's, that's up to code with the state and guidelines, but for a wheelchair accessibility, for accessibility walking, it's a hazardous trail as it is right now. I can't even um, leave my driveway because on Sidemo Road, people just rip, zip right through it right now as it is. Um, so there are no um, uh, stops on the road to prevent, to slow down. So with this trail and it not being all paved, how are, is the town going to make sure and sure that it's not hazardous, that it's accessible to all of us, um, and that it's, it's, it's a, safe, uh, a safe place to, to walk or to ride or have a, a wheelchair accessibility? So first of all, it will be, unlike Cider Mill Road, it will be 100% um, non-motorized traffic. So, so, you know, you won't have to worry about the automobile component. So the upper part, the part from the community center, up past where it says views, and it starts to go into the switchback, that you can make a really mild grade. So, you know, if you chose to pave it, that whole section can be fully ADA compliant. Where we get into the steep section, just simply because, you know, you have 150 feet of elevation gain and you have it in about a third of a mile, no set of switchbacks will make that fully uh, ADA accessible. Um, and because there's no road there, you can't apply pro ag. So the majority of this will be ADA accessible, but I, I'm not saying the whole thing will, sorry. Um, the, the end part where it starts going down the steep part will not be. I wish we could figure out how to design it so that it would be, but we just, we don't own enough land there and enough way to make switchbacks to bring the grade down. Yeah. Uh, Mark Scuston, that one, 389 Lake Road. Yeah. Why do we even want this? Do we know how many people think they want to use this? I mean, if you go up to the trail, anywhere, if there's parking lots, they've developed all the way along the way. Why do we think we need it from the community center to use this path? So my answer to that is twofold. Um, first, that was something that was identified in the last plan of conservation in development. That was one of the goals, which was linkage from this, the municipal complex, to the rail trail and then on to the ball fields um, down below. So that's one component. And the second thing is, I think in this day and age, anything you can do to, pro to promote healthy activity and walking and biking is worthwhile for a community. And if you look at where the youngest generation of people are moving to, you know, there's a, there is a, a large movement of people towards areas that are walkable and biteable. Um, and if we're gonna attract people, we're gonna attract young families, that's got to be part of the mix that we do as a town. But we really don't wanna attract people because of taxes most of the time and the school system. And it's going to cost a hundred thousand now, and maybe up to a million by the time we build it. All the yep. funds. All so the works projects are expensive. Right. There's nothing you're doing today that's inexpensive. So the red trail that we're looking at tonight, with the pink attached to it, that goes down to the rail trail, picking it up near the museum. Uh, no. The museum is closer to where the green trail intercepts. In fact, the green trail intercepts, but the green pathway intercepts fairly close to where the museum is. Okay, and is that green trail uh, the second phase of this? 
Like um, tonight we're here for 83,000 approval of this with 21 because of the red trail. So correct. There, both of those trails, both of those pathways are proceeding down different funding. They're at different stages and they're at different funding. But both of those grants were gotten. We proposed in both cases doing the opposite one to make it a loop. So we wrote that into both grants that one of the objectives of this was a complete loop. What was the yellow? The yellow. The yellow is the existing Hop River State State Park. Okay, so the near state park. The existing right. rail trail. Correct. <laughs> Yeah, I, I also look, wonder if we really need this. I mean, we've got lots of bike trails already. We've, we've seen them. This is a potential boondoggle of money. And we're going to be seeing in the next couple of years in mean, this town with the um, increase in the board of ed budget and the school attendance. Um, 20000 it's not that much, but 200000 would be. This is a um, just a step in, the, in that direction. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure we really need this. Sure, Scott Sawyer, uh, 168 Boston Hill Road. The money you said is going to come from the uh, existing building fund. Correct. I am assuming that through what we talked about here and there on the building, you know, that we're going to have kids to that as soon as we are clear to do it, which, which means, you know, past a certain threshold after it's occupied and whatever. But Correct. is that going to cut into that? that uh, it is not. Um, that's part of the reason, well, this is one of the reasons why we've been funding the multi-use building fund on an ongoing basis. We did put $50,000 into that in this budget cycle, so we have enough to cover that. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that we currently have a congressional request for funding that made it through the Senate Appropriations Commission as of two days ago. Um, that will go a long way towards funding the second phase of what we're doing with the community center. So what I'm trying to do is finish the community center and the generator for the, for the three building complex out of mostly federal funds. So I'm actually not using a lot of the multi-use building fund for that. No guarantees I'm going to get it. Still got to go through, but you know, it made it out of the, the state funding mechanism and it made it through the, the Senate Appropriations Committee. So I think it has a reasonable chance of being funded. Eric, sure. I just have a real quick one. Is there a list that we can look at anywhere that has a list of um, outstanding projects and their cost? So at least we know when people are saying, well, this could be, and we know what we're looking at future for costs of. I mean, I have a list. I have not published that list, okay. but no reason we can. Okay. Um, nothing secret, that's for sure. Uh, Bob Hamburger, Shoddy Mill Road. I just want to point out that as a town, we really have three town centers. We have the municipal town center here. We have the historic town center, which is where the railroad station was on Center Street. And we have the athletic town center over where the fields are. And we have very little to connect them so that somebody can walk or ride in between. So from my perspective, anything that we can do to integrate this town so that those town centers can be easily traversed by somebody on a bike or foot is a good idea. Sure. Jeff Ballard, uh, Lake Road. Now, when do you expect to have a certificate of occupancy on the seniors uh, community center? Uh, last week. Last week. Now, once you get that certificate of occupancy, doesn't that close the door on a million dollar budget? No. It's still part of the, I mean, the punch list and the final fees to the contract were all fitted under that. If uh, if we don't mind, can you keep it to the issues related to this grant and this application because that's what we're here for initially in this town meeting? Yeah, my point being is that after a period of time, 
when that million dollar obligation is done, maybe the $21,000 that the town is putting into this would be better to step on the senior center, community center. Okay, that's my opinion. Okay. Sure. I just want to remind everybody that there was recently a death on Route 316. A guy was on a motorcycle, a uh, bicycle. And uh, so, as someone who rides a bicycle and would love to utilize these trails, I think it's a win win. I mean, I applaud Erish for doing this work and getting this grant and uh, moving our town forward, like all the other towns are getting. You know, with trails that go through the town so that they go to different areas. That was an Ebert moment. Sorry? That was an Ebert, not yet. Yes, it's on 316, though. And our roads, you know, when you try to go down Lake Road, which would, would um, you could avoid it if you had that trail. A lot of times we try to go down Lake Road to the Dollar General down there, and that's a dangerous road. Are you looking for a motion? Please. Oh, got okay. it. Okay. Do you can make a motion to vote on this? Okay. Well, I think that we vote on this proposal. Okay. Who's second? Who's second? Second. Second. Yeah, we all do this. Okay. Motion to amend the second. You can't amend the second. You were given a paper ballot. That he has to know what's wrong. If you mark the bell, they'll come around with a ballot box and pick up the ballot. Okay, the Board of Selectmen will conduct a public hearing to receive public input on proposed revisions of the Charter of the Town of Andover set forth in the draft report of the Charter Revision Commission. We're now going to receive public input. Who wants to go first? Don Denham. I'll go first. So I do not support or agree on this new charter revision. I, I will oppose it as best I'm able. In particular, section 105H, the minor ordinance, section 402A, the general powers of the Board of Selectmen, and section 301A, which is again with the ordinance, and in section 702, which is the town clerk. Uh, I'll get on my list. Section 105 is the minor ordinance. The elimination of this section removes, obviously, the public hearing and gives the power to enact all ordinances to the Board of Selectmen. I view this as an assault on our democracy by taking away the public views and taking away our decision making, giving it to five people. This section should be restored to its original content, <coughs> government by the people, for the people. Two, section 402 labeled general powers and duties. The word powers should be removed. We are in power. We're the, we're the taxpayer, we're the citizens, we're the voters. We should have the power. Section A and B should be restored to the original text. The power needs to remain with the people, the taxpayers, and citizens of Andover, not the five select. I've attended almost every town budget meeting since I've moved here 30 years ago. In most public hearings, I support the current process. It does not need to be fixed. Attendance can be can vary depending on the issues, but those who make the effort to come to the meetings know that they have an opportunity to speak or on a particular ordinance or on a particular town budget line item. <sighs> Take a breath. Town clerk, this has always been an elected position, and I feel strongly it should be made that way. The town has been blessed with Marge and Carol, but a four year appointed position by the current five selectmen is unwarranted and unnecessary. And, and I would truly like to know why 
the charge of vision committee or, and or these people, I think that needs to be changed. I believe that the tax collector and the assessor are appointed, are appointed as well. But I don't see that they have to be reappointed in four years. Is that correct, Mr. Weckman? Do you know that? Change that? I, I can say that what the, what the Charter Commission is trying to do is trying to make the town clerk's position more like a town administrator's position because in the situation where you're voting for an individual such as Carol Lee, we know what we're getting. Sure. But the issue is when Carol leaves us. What are we doing? Well, I'm, I'm confident that when Carol reaches the mandatory retirement of age of 80, <laughs> <laughs> minimum, minimum. <laughs> Qualified people will step forward. Um, the charter revision needs to be revisited. This stands as a power grab in our power time government operating for decades. We should have a voice and a vote on all time ordinances and they should be presented at a public hearing. The Board of Selectmen does not have any more power than it already has. Our town clerk Position to remain the elected position. Thank you. All right, so um, most of you who know us know that it is very, very rare that Don Bentley and I agree on anything. Pigs are flying. Yeah, pigs are flying, exactly. Um, so, uh, I, I have pretty much the same complaints, same objections. Scott, to, I'm skating. Oh, sorry, Scott Soya at Boston Hill Road. Um, so, I have pretty much the same objections. Um, I think it's a power grab. I think that we need to keep the democracy in town, the small, the small town, town meeting style democracy. Uh, if we lose it, we're never going back. I think it's been a, it's not been perfect. It's, it's messy, it's ugly but it's important. Um, and then I feel the same about Carol's position. I also, at the last hearing, brought up a bunch of technical things about the charter, and a couple of them got changed, but some of them are still there. So this is, I think, a mess of a charter. There's typos, there's, um, they, they, they get the thing. Um, you, you mentioned uh, 105H. Um, well, that's, this 105 is a section on definitions. And they've got something there that's totally not a definition. Um, the, uh, I, I think it's a hurry process. I think that was part of the problem. Um, I've got a bunch of others. Um, I'll give you guys copies of my notes again. Um, what else? Um, in, in one section, we have, the, it says something like, the board of selectmen shall have legislative authority for all matters not specifically enumerated here and after in section 304. Including but not limited to all those powers, whatever. So basically, we're saying we're referring to this other section when we're saying we have those, but the section no longer applies, but we're going to keep the section there. So they fixed it this time by taking out that section altogether. So now we have language that says that we're referring to this section that doesn't even exist. Um, so, I, and I think, I, I think it's a sign of a hurry process. Um, I wonder why it was done during summertime if they thought there was less chance of people showing up and responding, or if it was just as, as they said. Um, you know, this needs to be done for, so we can get it on a presidential ballot, um, which, which is a legitimate thing, but I think we should have started much earlier if that was a concern. Um, and a couple other, several other um, minor things. They fixed the other one that, that really worried me where they tried to assert um, authority over the local school board's grants. Um, that's, that's been removed, and I'm glad to see that. But an awful lot of stuff hasn't been removed, and an awful lot of stuff is just power grabbing, don't say enough. That's, there's my notes. Um, I, I think that we should, as I need to use, the board should table this or only do the, most, the least controversial things, changing the dates of the vote, things like that. Bring that to referendum, that's fine. Um, and then try this again with more time and with the committee council of our Okay, thank you. Thank you.
These two guys are a hard act to follow. I'm Jerry from May. I live at 8 Fern Way. Um, I'm here for a reason this evening. I want to share my thoughts with you about the Charter Vision Commission's recommendation for change in our town charter. And also, I'm learning things from listening to other people here. Um, anytime I go to a town meeting that involves spending of money, approving this, a $250,000 bond mower, whatever, I've learned by listening to other people. I learned by the questions you ask and the answers you get. Um, so that's why I'm here, and I wrote this out for myself. I'm, I'm not living it. Uh, sometimes change is necessary. I think you're being proactive to want to come up with a plan. What happens in Carolina? She is a, she's not a, an easy person to replace. She loves this town. She gives her heart and soul into it. And it's good that she's getting ready to put when she wants to retire, you're not, you're not going to deny her that. So I don't have the answer. What I would start with is talking to Carol Lee and say, Carol, how would you go about doing that? <clears throat> and, and interview other talents. Yeah. Go and answer the talents. It's yeah. how she worked out. Yeah. Um, so sometimes change is necessary. But many times, it's not. Our budget procedures, I think, work well. You've got a framework in place. Why change it if it doesn't need to be changed? Um, you've probably heard it many times. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, changes come with their cha uh, changes come with their own sets of pros and cons. In order to determine the impact of the changes, time to analyze it is necessary. As a resident, I feel as though the town flew through this Charter Revisioning Commission and they were rushed. Rushed to get something to produce quickly so that it could meet the November election. Um, people need time to analyze things and come up with, what, how do I feel about this? Um, we have to process those changes and we have to Think about the implications of them. And that's why I like being in here with you tonight, because I'm learning a lot of things from other people. In Andover, the town meeting is our legislative body. Our residents attend town meetings and vote. Who votes count? It doesn't matter whether I say yes and everybody says no, or somebody says no and everybody says yes. That doesn't matter. What matters is I'm getting a chance to explore and put myself in other people's places, in other people's shoes. Um, I believe that any time you call for a town meeting to make a decision or put an item out to a referendum, the town residents are much closer to being in control of what they want for their town. People have had the chance to share their thoughts and ideas. I'd rather have a vote of 50 to 75 res residents taken at a town meeting as opposed to the no capacity with where it is your board, as opposed to having the voice of just five select persons. As a residents think about the revision suggested by the Charter Review Commission, they should ask themselves this question. How does this recommended change impact my ability to have a say in my local government? Is this change needed? What are the advantages of this change? And what are the disadvantages? That being said, we'd like to thank all the individuals who worked tirelessly on the Charter Division Commission. You volunteered your time for many hours to serve the Andover community in this way. For that, I'm truly thankful. Hi, I'm Bob Gamber, live on Shoddy Mill Road. Um, I volunteered and served on the Charter Review Commission, and in fact, I was uh, flattered that they chose me to chair the commission. So I wanted to just 
provide a little bit of insight. I have nothing prepared. I didn't really expect to speak tonight, but I feel compelled to say a few things just to give a little bit of insight onto how we, how we put all of this together. Um, as chair, I tried as much as possible to be as nonpartisan as possible. I didn't want to steer the outcome. I just wanted to try to shepherd the process and let the process work as it's designed. We had seven members. My vote was just one of them. And as I said, I tried to stay as, as center of the road and neutral as possible. Um, I agree that uh, when things don't need to be changed, they shouldn't be changed. Um, as far as the process being rushed, you should know that the initial list of items that we had was almost twice as long as the list that we actually decided to deliberate on. Some things we decided were too complex, were not important enough, um, and that we didn't have time to be able to give them any type of uh, appropriate consideration. And so the answer to those was, we'll talk about those in the next cycle. Um, of the things that we, that we did settle on, the one thing that I want to give a little bit more insight into is uh, Carol and the town clerk. Uh, as, as Jeff mentioned, um, we, wanted, we, we, we know that, that she is a very strong candidate, that, that she has served the town tirelessly. Eventually, she, she's going to retire. Um, one of the big advantages of having an appointed position like, uh, like Eric's is that we, don't, we aren't restricted to someone who lives here in town. And one of the things that we've seen time again with the various boards and commissions that we have in town is that we have trouble finding people who are qualified and willing and able. And that one change of making it appointed versus elected allows us to expand where we can look. And I think that's, that's an important distinction. Um, there's a lot of other things I could talk about if I was prepared, but I just wanted to add those things to the conversation. Thanks. So, so Bob, can I ask you a question? Sure. Now, the uh, Charter Revision Committee, um, is it accurate to say that one of the things on their agenda initially was to eliminate the town meeting? No. 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 That's, that's that, that conspiracy theory. Yes, no. <laughs> that subject, as you have just framed it, never came up. Never came up. Never came up to eliminate the town meeting. No, absolutely not. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, as you as you pointed out, there are certain parts of the process where it would be where we are proposing that it not be included as it is included then. But the elimination of the town meeting in its entirety, no, absolutely, was never discussed in any conference. So you just got to like you talk about maybe turning the backs. Yes. Yes. In the sake for the sake of efficiency, in a lot of cases, that's how it was framed. Saving money then. Efficiency saving money, two terms I hate that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably a fair yeah. fair way to, to frame it. Yeah. Well, I'm a, a believer in it. Okay. It's not we'll also fix it. Huh? Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions while I'm up here? Um, hi. Liz Logan. Yes. Um, about your question about the town meeting. I think it's not the town meeting that was hoped as being eliminated, it's the vote asked the town meeting is that correct like for the town people that show up at that town meeting to vote in support of the uh, budget is that correct the town meeting will continue in the exact same way it can you can reduce the budget you get to ask any questions okay. you get to vote on budget reductions we're not voting to move the budget forward or against it's not an up or down what it is is you make decisions to reduce the budget and then that budget goes directly to the referendum. So right now, the way that the town meeting works, it's 40 or 50 people that show up here, come to a town meeting, and we all raise our hand and we talk about how our budget's too high, and then we have the potential to sit there and make a motion to lower the budget item. Those are either accepted or rejected, and at the end of the meeting, we vote the budget up or down, yes or no. And then at a yes or no vote, it goes to referendum. The only thing that we were attempting to do, which goes into all of the other issues that we would want to address, is consolidating the, the budget referendum date with the RAM date. So we go to a one-time referendum to vote both on RAM and the town budget at the same time, the first time. It can fail. The RAM budget can fail or the town budget can fail. And then we have to go through the process again. 
Right. But the only thing that we sat there and did from a financial standpoint, other than we did make adjustments to uh, raise or uh, raise some of the thresholds that were required. <clears throat> like right now, we have a $2,500 threshold on a town grant that Eric can't, in the current charter, we're not even supposed to apply for a grant unless we go to a town meeting and get it voted. It's incredibly inefficient. So what we did is, is there's some percentages up and down, some dollars on it, but everything goes to a referendum. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Scott, I mean, with the exception of um, ordinances, that, that's a change. I mean, yeah. I know there's a uh, petition process. Yeah. Yeah. Process. A petition process, which you can force anything to a referendum. The, the Board of Selectmen is not an, an important organization that's going to make these these ordinances where you feel that you're, if you disagree with an ordinance, it's easier to change and to get the ordinance on a referendum battle than it is to get everybody organized to come to a meeting and sit here. It's 50 signatures. It's not a lot. You know, so if we read it, it's, it's an efficiency issue. It has nothing to do with power or attempting to, to usurp the authority of voting. The voter will still vote on it if they choose to. Um, thank you. I'll just, I'll just read you right back. Okay, if, if this charter revision passes a referendum, okay, we will not be able to have significant input in a public hearing on any ordinance. Okay, so our first select we can say get a little clerk 50 50 signature. Well, I would rather hold the one with the public hearing. Where we've seen many ordinances at public hearings, I mean, most of them just breeze through. But we should be able to sit here, have them present it, and then vote on it. Uh, do we all want to go out and collect 50, 50 signatures so we can <clears throat> have a, a process that we, we've always had here for the last 30 or 40 years that I've been here? Uh, I don't mind it. So the, the ordinance, okay, they want these board of selectmen. Want to be able to take over and enact ordinances, and then if you disagree, you've got to fight them with a, with a petition and 50 signatures in the process. It's, it's not it's just easy, it's not easy to do. Thank you. And then a quorum. Well, one, one second. Town Attorney Dennis O'Brien. Yes, there has to be a public hearing for any ordinance the you know, Board of Selectmen brings up. The difference is it's not a town meeting, but they would hold a public hearing. So you have a public hearing, you have an opportunity to talk to them. You know, if you don't trust them, fine, you know, do the town meeting. But frankly, we, you know, how many voters do you have in town? 2,000? How many people show up at a town meeting? The bears. The bears. That depends on the. Uh, well, you had a vote turnout tonight. It's a pretty good turnout. But still, still, you're allowing uh, 50 people to make a decision. Well, so it's supposed to be a five people to make a decision. But they were elected by the, by the rest of the town, by the whole, by the whole electorate. It's, well, it's a difference between the five It's a difference between it's representative it's government and town meeting. This is a public hearing. This is a public hearing to us. I, I won't. I won't go. The issue is the that issue is that any ordinance that gets put up from the, the, the board of selectmen, any board of selectmen, puts up from has that public hearing. It has to go through the residents. Then it sits there and it goes through a different process than it currently does. That is what's being right now. Anyone else? Anyone different wants to? Not different, just adding. No, 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 no. no. I mean, of course, different as an individual person. Oh, different person. Anyone other than Don? Anyone other than Don? Don can come back at the end. So, summarize. Okay, I, um, I always preface my statements with I'm the new kid on the block. I've only three years. My concern was like um, Scott said, uh, 105. Yes, he oh, even Oh, Chair, Chair Bonnie Your name? Susan Cameron, I apologize. Susan Camarota, senior driver, veterans representative. I don't know what else I can grab. Um, chair body wrote 53 chair brother. Anyway, I agree with Scott about section 105 definitions that totally limited the definition for that phrase, my ordinance. There was no such definition left after you crossed everything off. And back to the election of the town clerk. Again, two or three years. This is a different four when it was here three years ago, so elections were. <clears throat> So Carol, I don't think, was forced to re-say for herself for for election. I don't think anybody was forced to not 
oppose her every election by having a have a big every very long. So she could have been voted out of that spot twenty years ago. Five years ago. Ten years ago. So what difference does that make if Carol leans or Carol doesn't lean? Somebody in this town should be able to take over that position. Or we could just say we can appoint the board. You maybe have better, smarter people outside of the town of Andover to be on the board, if that's what you're saying. To be the better, smarter person that lives in the town of Andover to be the town. It's not very helpful because that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I have a question, I guess John can do really quickly. What actually is the difference between the public and the public here in the town meeting? Can you vote it for the public? It's the way it's coming across the far. You got it. You got it, Catherine. Town meeting, you vote. Well, the public, public hearing, you don't. You don't. Correct. Take votes. Yes. Okay, that was an important question. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Catherine McGaldy Lewis, um, Oak Farms, or in Connecticut. Um, all right, I have a couple of things. As far as the minor ordinance, uh, Section 105, again, I agree. I can't believe I'm going to agree with John and me, but I do. I probably, yeah, there have, to, I probably there have to faint after this. Speak up, Josh. Speak up. Okay, see, if that piece didn't get that, 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 that that's fine. Um, we never had, and we still do not have, an actual definition for what my own ordinance is. And that's always bothering me. So I really wish that we could come up with my ordinance definition. And as far as having, changing it so that the board is allowed to amend or repeal or do whatever they want to do without actually having the town meeting does bother me. Um, and it's not at all that I don't trust this board. I like everyone on this board. I trust everyone on this board. I just think that I don't want to take the authority of the town meeting away from its people yeah. of the town. That's what it's there for. That is what we've always done in New England, and that's the way I'd like to keep it. Um, and also, I think you should just, for a few things, like I have an example that if you wanted to, if this board wanted to, I would think, change the taxes to be collected annually or biannually or whatever, you would be able to do that. If the owner should be able to do that, we would not be able to vote on it. Is that correct? That's not correct because if we How did that, it? you would get 50 signatures and okay. go to referendum and then you'd vote it at all. If you get, if we are able to go for the You can't get 50 signatures. You know you can get 50 signatures. Some people don't even want to knock over the door. Yes. Why would you want to leave a signature there? Why do I want, make you want to come here for a town meeting? We haven't done a tremendous we, number. There are like a lot of things that the boards in the last four years have wanted to do, and we've held off because we have not wanted to drag everyone to a public meeting. That's why when we have had public meetings, we've had six or seven things on the agenda to go through. I now, don't disagree listen, with that, but I also, I, but I don't believe that it's right to ask them, change the position process, right. do something like that. Because I don't, I don't disagree that we shouldn't be hamstrung by the fact that you need a, a, a room full of people. I agree with that. And I agree that we should progress and do di different things. I really do. But I don't believe that the process should be our only choices now to walk door to door and get 50 signatures. Okay. Okay. Um, the town clerk, I think the major difference between appointed and elected, and everybody should know this, is that as an appointed, no, you do not have to be a town resident, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, elected, you must be. I don't see the issue either way. I'm not opposed or, I just feel that either way, if we we're going to do it correctly, then Carol would be the person that would have to at least make sure that next person is qualified and can do their job and then have a, a um, succession plan. Thanks. <laughs> you have a plan in place and what her duties are so that the next person can step in and go forward. Whether you're appointed or elected, you should be able to do that. Um, the next thing, and I'm, I don't have a lot. Uh, I, again, I like with Section uh, 301 in general, it's basically saying that you're taking away the authority from the Andover residents to vote in town meeting and giving it to the board of Um And the, oh, again, right now I think it is ridiculous that it's on the uh, charter that you can spend $2,500 or whatever. That's, in this day and age, it's crazy. I don't know if I think it's okay to up it to 50,000 without a town meeting, but I do agree that 2,500 is bizarre. 
And um, let's see if I have anything else I want to say. Um, I think I might have three, believe it or not. Uh, so, oh, the only other thing was that on section uh, B of finance and taxation, it says that the boards now, the agencies and boards, whatever, are going to be given their, um, their budgets to the town manager rather than the board of finance. And I didn't understand why they would want to do that, so I would like to have that explained, since I believe that's part of the board of finance function and not town manager's function. Um, and what does that do? How does that change the, the board of finance? Um, and doesn't that slow the profit for all? And I think that's it. I think that's it. Thank you. So, the question is all on the matter of the town clerk. When someone's elected to the office of the town clerk, are there standards or, or uh, test uh, certifications. certifications, qualifications yeah, yeah. before they can run? Like, how do you verify the person's you know, qualified for position before they run? So, I can answer that. You don't have to be qualified to run. Any electric in the town of Andover can run for town clerk. Um, there is a multi year process to become a qualified town clerk, but you can hold the position without being a qualified town clerk. Ideally, if that's the case, the assistant clerk would be the qualified town clerk. A town can work with either a fully trained and certified assistant or a fully trained and certified town clerk. Um, it's been a lot of years since we've had an assistant town clerk that was fully certified, um, certainly not in my tenure. So, uh, and the current assistant town clerk is not certified, nor is she an Andover resident. So, even though she's probably the most qualified person to take Carol's job, she would be unable under her current system because she is not uh, currently residing in Andover. Now, she could choose to move to Andover, but I don't think she intends to do that. Um, so the advantage, there's advantages and disadvantages to both being elected and appointed. Um, the advantage to being appointed is that you have a much wider pool to choose from. Um, instead of picking one person out of roughly 2,500 adults, you know, you have an entire state and you can poach a qualified assistant town clerk that's been certified from another town, which is what most larger municipalities do. Um, it hasn't happened for a long time because we've been very fortunate that Carol has done this job for, you know, 26 or 27 years. Um, and it certainly isn't. Towns, what? Do you know what the surrounding towns of Fever and Gotham, Jersey, Columbia? Um, I know statewide it's roughly 50 50 elected versus appointed. So it's just a different, you know, we, we have struggled to fill the position of assistant town clerk um, pretty consistently, um, and it's been a kind of a revolving door. Um, hopefully we're stable with that position right now, but there, you know, so I'm not saying one is necessarily better than the other, but I think for a small town to be sure you're gonna find somebody that's a competent town clerk, you know, it's not a guarantee, that's for sure. But if a town clerk is appointed, that town clerk is not an autonomous person anymore, right? That town clerk answers directly to the town manager? Mm -hmm. yes. uh, well, I'm a town administrator, not a town manager. Okay, sorry, town manager. Yes, that person would. But remember that the thing that regulates the action of the town clerk is state statute far more than the individual town. I mean, Carol's is beholden to state law far more than town ordinances or anything else. But I mean, that's state law, not town politics. That is well, correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just to look at it from that point of view. Okay. I'd rather go to Bob. Let someone speak who has Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, just something that hasn't been enumerated before this group, and I'm not sure if it's clear or not, 
Uh, with regard to the, the charter revisions, we're not intending this to be an all or nothing kind of thing. We intend there to be six or seven different line items on the ballot in November, each of which encompasses the different concepts that we're bringing here. There are several different concepts that have been introduced, such as the budgetary thresholds, or the town clerk, or the minor ordinances, and all of these things are going to be put together as separate line items. So we don't have to vote yes or no on the entire thing. We're going to be able to vote these individual items up or down as you see fit. That's the first thing I wanted to mention. And my apologies for coming here and speaking extemporaneously, but this is just how it, how it works. Um, with regard to Carol and the town clerk's position, Carol was on, is on the uh, Charter Review Commission. And, and this is a matter of public record. If you watch the videos or look at the transcripts, you can see what I'm about to say here, which is that at the beginning of the process, she opposed the uh, change to an appointed position. And as discussion and debate and various things were introduced, she actually changed her mind. And she endorses the idea of an appointed position right now, just for the record. Well, she voted yes for it. We won't say that she is in favor. She voted yes on the Charter Revision Commission to move that forward. OK. How she votes is her, her own issue. Scott. First of all, my talk with Carol is that she was remaining studiously um, found committed about this. She, I mean, she told me that she, told me she was not going to make any um, any points. I thought she was going to vote on, the, on that measure either, but I'm not sure if that happened or not. Um, but the question I really wanted to ask, and it's probably for Bob, um, the process then. Do you guys realize that this document that you're looking at is not on the town website? I checked it at noon today. I called the town. Clark, I got the assistant clerk, and she emailed it to me. But which uh, document are you talking about? Okay. The, uh, the, the, okay, the changes from July 17th, um, the, the latest version you guys are working with. The, the, the July 8th one is on the, on the website. Uh, that, that is something that we have to discuss with the town clerk. Okay, so the town clerk, who also in Bob's absence was the chairperson. Uh, the Charter Review Commission had all the documents. All those documents were supposed to be submitted to the assistant to the administrator, and they should have been up online. If they're not, I apologize, but it's in our office anyway. But, but it all looks based on our. It does. I just have a quick question because I don't know if this would make it a win win or not. Can the petition process be changed? Can the petition the process? Petition process. It can be if we vote it back to the to the Charter Revision Commission. Because I just thought at least then it would take care of people's anxiety about having to go get 50 signatures, signatures, which doesn't seem like a lot to you, but when's the last time you went out and did throw the door lock? Mm -hmm. I, know, I know the DTC, if they would like to get 50 signatures and addresses, all that's required, not yes or no, you get 50 signatures. But my ETA, question is, ETA, you get 50 signatures. I can't the that. RTC can get 50 signatures. So it's you not say, a monstrous pressure. So you say. But my question is, I'm trying to look at both sides here, and I'm not helping. I'm trying to ask if the petition process is something that can be looked at and changed. And, and that way you get to... In, in, our, board meeting, in our board meeting, if we choose to push anything back to the, the Charter Commission Commission, yes, it can be potentially met. I have a question about that as well. Because I was reading all this stuff to be prepared for this meeting. My understanding, and maybe I missed it in one of the meetings, was that after after the ordinance is agreed upon, the townspeople get a letter, and then they, they have 20 days, right, which I didn't actually get for this meeting today. <laughs> um, um, and then they can send it back saying, yeah, I don't like that, or whatever. So that in itself is not the petition process? That is the petition that is, So if, if 700, or so 700 people send those cards back and say no, then no, that's the petition the process? It, the way it works is there'll be a petition form in the town clerk's office or any organization you go on get. This gets to the town clerk's office, this letter. Okay. Right? It takes yep. seven days. The board of has a meeting. They vote on it. This mail goes out from the town. Right. It then gets mailed to every resident within the community 
The town clerk's office gets some of these. The town clerk stamps their mailing. You have 20 days from the date that the mailing was received by the town clerk to get 50 signatures. Oh. 50 signatures yeah. for 20 days once it gets there. And then it goes immediately to referendum. It does not go into, it does not become implemented. Nothing happens. Right. It then goes to referendum. Okay, that's the part I didn't understand. So I could see. Anything on that thought? Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, I, I, I've said it already. I just, I just, okay. <laughs> yeah. so, I just, I think it's, it's, like, it's a serious problem. <laughs> So, but it's just, I want to just address something Bob Amber about the town clerk. Don, you're good. Thank you. The uh, Carol Lee did not commit to um, say that she was for the appointed position. I think she was uncommitted. Okay? So she and, and I appreciate Jeff's uh, clarification and the, 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 the way that he stated it was clear. Yes. She voted to advance the item further. I see the microphone. Where's the microphone? We need it. We got twenty thousand dollars to, to do a study, but we can't we know the, the PA in this place, huh? They request ten thousand dollars. Who's the PA yeah. so you know the microphone? I'm Catherine Hutchinson. I live on Bunker Hill Road. <clears throat> and I have allergies, so excuse me if I have to keep clearing my throat. I was going to address this last, but because it was the last topic before we got up here. I'll address it and maybe I can refer to it at the end. As it was just indicated that if an ordinance is passed, then the town can repeal it by filing the appropriate <coughs> petition to repeal it. And it does require the 50 signatures at this point. And if that's the case, then the referendum is held. But I want to read you from the ordinance itself. The ordinance shall stand approved by the referendum unless a majority of the electors voting shall have voted in favor of repealing such ordinance. Provided, however, that at least 10% of the registered voters of the town shall have voted on the matter. Any ordinance not so repealed shall take effect the next day. Now, I read that to me, <coughs> excuse me, is what, roughly over the low 2000. So even though the 50 signatures are obtained, approved by the, verified by the town board, goes to the board of selectmen and they set the referendum. An affirmative vote to repeal at that town meeting, or at that referendum, isn't enough unless uh, more than the 10% uh, of the registered voters at that point have participated. So let's just take, for example, it's 220 is 10%. And there are 219 of us voting there, and we all vote to repeal. That ordinance would not be repealed. Mm -hmm. um, can I have one thing for you, Ms. Yes. Um, any referendum has to occur in the May or November election yes. time. No special referendum dates. No, no special dates. So it's not immediately. It, what you it's, said. it's not immediately. It's at the next election or the next yes. referendum. Yeah. Right. But when it goes so it's through the referendum. Right, and, 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 and what Jeff was saying, there's no election, there's a budget referendum right. again. There could be an ordinance that's attempted to be passed by the board of selectmen that the residents, the town residents, want to repeal. Yes. 50 signatures goes referendum. It would be on a budget vote or on the state election in November. No other time. I understand. Yeah. I use the term referendum vote on the referendum as using the language that the uh, ordinance uses. Yeah, oh, and I, yeah, and I would sit there and, 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 and go, it's two, let's say it's 200. I don't think it had less than 200 voters at one of those elections ever. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, we yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Budget? Yes. Oh, yeah. We got a budget. We got a budget. We got a budget. Now you got to show up. 
My experience is when people are interested, they show up, right? Right. All right, so I understand I'm going to generally just speak about the um, portion of the proposed charter revision dealing with the town meeting that is the ordinance that should be related. Now, we all learned that you in our first and first class, somewhere along the line, that there are three branches of government in the United States. The judicial, the elective, and the legislative branch. Here in Andor, as you all know, the town meeting is our legislative branch. That's you and I. That's you and I and every elector in this town. We're the legislative branch in this town. And we come to a town meeting and where we present, we ask questions, we listen to what other people have to say, and we have our say. And then we vote. And sometimes, hopefully, most of the time, it goes the way we vote. But if it doesn't, and we don't, it doesn't go the way we vote, it's still the process. It's still the process by which we all get a chance to participate, even though we always don't win, so to speak. We lived in town a long time. I think we do a pretty good job. I think we do a pretty good job in the other way. Now, there are times when maybe 25 people show up. But 25 people are 25 people out of, let's say, 22,000 or so electors that are privileged to be able to come to that meeting. But we had the opportunity. Maybe we chose not to because it wasn't something that interested and we didn't care one way or the other. But it's also been my experience to see so many people want to do this on the way to transfer the town meeting to a larger facility. You all see that. <clears throat> so why should we give up? Why do we want to give up our right to have a say on the laws that are governing our town? As I said a minute ago, as we started to discuss it before, uh, again, to repeat, the revision that's proposed would take that right away from us. The proposed uh, Provision in the ordinance, the rebate, child rebate. As we started out, or I started out, because I'm going to finish it over there, with call for, as we said a minute ago, the refiling of the, <coughs> of the, um, just for the referent. Exactly. Thank you. Sorry. And, yeah, that's it. And, uh, the Board of Selectmen, as I said, are required to hold a special, rent of them, special referendum. And I'm repeating myself because this is what I was going to finish up with, but I started with it. That means, as I said before, that one short of 10% of the electors, let's say 220, 219 of us come and vote, but we haven't let that. 10% that that provision is going to stand and become the law here the next day. Why do we want to give up the right? It's very, very important right. heard a lot of good things tonight, and I agree. I do not want to give up my power and my choice of voting and expressing my opinion. I don't want someone making it for me. I don't want things decided for me. <laughs> I'm very in favor of town meetings and referendums. Um, some of you, I think, know that I went door to door, got 130 signatures to have a study done about regionalization. Well, little did I know 
it wasn't an official uh, petition. And so it was denied and never went anywhere. And I wasted my time. I never want to have to go through that again. And I think it's unfair to say, oh, 50 signatures. No, I, I'm very much opposed to that. And I'm not sure how I feel about elected or appointed Carol Lee. I'd like to see appointed, you know, uh, I'd like to see promoted within locally. I, that can't happen, I guess, at this point. Or to have someone from town brought up to the ranks and qualified and tutored and, and, and assisted. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Maybe this is an Eric question now for you, the rest of the world. In the last four years, how many minor ordinances have we passed? Well, what is the definition of a minor ordinance? We don't have a definition. Well, there's a definition, but it's not very good. It's in the chart. I think that's all. It's right. It's in there. Take a look. Yeah. Everything that we voted, we we've gone to town. Mm -hmm. About four. Four, maybe five. Well, right, that's just a little bit. Where's up? <laughs> Hi, I'm Leanne Hutchinson on Bunker Hill Road. Um, I'm not going to bring up anything new because everything that I wanted to state has been covered. I just want to say that I have followed the process. I've attended several of the Charter Review Zoom committee meetings. I've spoken during public speak and I've read um, up on all the minutes of meetings I was able to attend. And I want to express my agreement with some of the points that have been brought up tonight including not taking any legislative power away from the town meeting. Um, I think people who get themselves, quote unquote, to a town meeting deserve the attention that that brings. Um, I've been to town meetings where things went my way and other times where I didn't agree with the final result, but at least it's the New England Democratic um, format that people have fought and died so that we can show up and express our opinion. Um, I also don't agree with the process, what I consider a long process that's proposed for repealing an ordinance. I think it's cumbersome um, to wait until the next referendum. And I also just want to um, also express my opinion that having followed this process from the beginning, I'm not completely sure how it originated in the first place. I, I just don't think it's necessary the way it's proposed. Um, so those, I just wanted to say for the record that those are the main points that have already been stated that I agree with. Thanks. All right, second question. So this document has an awful lot of changes proposed in it. And I just want to talk a little bit about, because what I don't want to see is everybody thrown out because everybody's pissed about a couple portions of this. So number one, the state several years ago pretty much required all the towns to go to uh, elections in the fall. And over for many years had spring elections. We no longer do. Uh, there's a very cumbersome process to get back to the possibility of May elections, which I don't think we as a town want to go through. So we ought to, we ought to make the charter change to officially codify that elections will be in November, because our charter says one thing and state law says another thing. So we should change that section in the charter, which is section 203, general elections. Um, you can make a decision whether or not the town clerk uh, position is included in that. Um, that's uh, neither here nor there. So that makes sense. The second thing is section 210, which covers early voting. Again, that is state law. We are simply making the charter in that section match what state law is. And that state law now says early voting is a thing. So regardless of whether we have it in our charter or not, we're obligated to do it. So we might as well make our charter uh, consistent. 
Um, as far as the town budget meeting goes, the, I think the, the goal there really was to drive voter participation at the referendum. Because the reality is we have usually two budget votes a week apart, one for RAM, one for the town budget. We typically get, what, a little less than 5% of the electorate votes on the RAM budget. So 5% of the taxpayers vote on 40% of the town spending. It's ridiculous. By combining those two together and having one vote, at least initially, that covers both budgets, I think the goal was to get more people out to vote, you know, so we get a higher turnout and it's more representative of what people actually want. So I think that, to me, is a worthwhile thing to consider. Um, the second thing is, right now, there's no lower limit on leases, um, you know, at which it doesn't have to go to town meeting. Okay, so that means the $200 a year lease for the thing in the town clerk's office that runs the postage through the meter, that technically has to go to town meeting. And there are lots and lots of things like that. Now, I mean, if you look at it objectively, there's 20 or 30 things that either us uh, as a town or the Board of Education would have to go to town meeting for because we have no lower threshold on that. So that's frankly dumb um, because, you know, there's, that's just too many things. I don't think most of you really care, you know, that we're spending a couple hundred dollars a year to lease the, the postage machine. At least I would hope you uh, don't you consider that a normal cost of business. So you threat, set that threshold high enough so that when we go to buy something expensive or lease something expensive, like a plow truck or something of that nature, that you all get to say and weigh in on it. And you leave the little stuff to the Board of Finance and Board of Selectmen to approve. So in my opinion, that makes sense to allow that, uh, that change in the charter. Um, to go through it. Um, so that is section 304E uh, under leases. And the other one is grants. So um, how many of you here have had a hand in writing one of the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving grants? Any of you go to town meeting to accept that? You go to town meeting to accept that? Did you? No, we didn't, because practically there's too many little grants that run through this town. And that's all funding that we get from the state that we use to lower taxes and get things done in the town. Um, so going to public meeting for a big grant, absolutely appropriate. If we're going to spend, you know, a big chunk of your tax dollars, absolutely. That should go to town meeting. You should absolutely have a say in it. But the little stuff, I mean, you know, the, the old cemetery association, pretty much every year, they go for a grant for maintaining the headstones. Well, so, but the town also budgets money in that line item. So technically, every single year, we should be going to town meeting for that. And there are many things in that category. So I would urge you to pass that just as a reasonable governance change. What number is that? Uh, that is... Uh, 304 G which is participation in any federal state or private grant program um, so that one I think is worth the town pursuing obviously some of these other things are controversial um, the other one is administrative positions so currently uh, under section 702 D and E those are two positions that the town right now doesn't exactly line up with the charter. In the case of the director of health, it says we shall appoint the director of health as mandated by the state of Connecticut. Well, 
in that that person is a part-time employee. Well, we're part of a regional health organization. We're part of Eastern Highlands Health District. I'm on the board of directors of that. I'm also on the executive board of that organization. So that's a shared service that we are part of, but they're not town employees. So our charter does not match what we actually do. So I would urge you to accept section 702 for administrative positions. Excuse me, how, how would you go about that then? If we're a regional, we're part of the Eastern Health. How do you change that to the board selectman who appoint the director of health? Because that's because I'm all the board of selectmen it just ratifies the fact that we use Eastern Highlands Health District. The only thing you're strike, we're not adding anything. We're basically striking the fact that it says the director of health is employed mm -hmm. part time in the town because he is not a town employee. He's an employee of Eastern Highlands Health District. But we don't appoint them either. I mean, should that, uh, I guess my question is, should we be restating that entire, because we don't apply, we don't employ them. I don't think that we've ever actually. Um, Follow their charter. So we <laughs> voted, we voted years ago yes. to join right. Eastern Eastern Highlands Health, Health right. District when they were expanding. Um, and we've been a part of that organization ever since. Right. Um, we pay into it. We're part of the governing body of that, um, and we get a lot of really good service, both us and the school. So to me, that makes sense. The second thing is animal control officer. Um, currently, we use NECOG, which is the Northeast Council of Governments Animal Control Services to cover the town, um, as opposed to having our own. And there's two parts to that. The first is the state changed the laws several years ago regarding animal control facilities and the cost to take our what was our animal control facility and make it uh, meet state law is really expensive. So we don't really have any intention of going back to having our own animal control officer and own animal control facility. Um, you know, Technically today, animal control facilities have to be air conditioned. Um, they have an awful lot of standards that we, we frankly can't meet without beating, building a standalone facility for that. So by changing that, this the charter says that we're going to have our own officer. All this charter change does is allow us to use a shared service for that. So I think you should uh, past that, I think that's reasonable, and that matches what we actually do for governance. Um, and then the changes to the way the budget runs, uh, just what I want to say right now is our, our charter currently calls that out kind of two different ways. So obviously the Board of Finance has final authority for the budget that goes to the public. But what happens is Prior to the start of the budget process, each department head gets, uh, submits a budget, each department head, each board and commission submits a budget to the town, to m both myself and the finance director. They all get collated into a budget and then if it's reviewed, that gets passed out to the board of selectmen and board of finance. So, most of what's in here is what we're actually doing now is actually the way the process works. For the most part, the Board of Finance is not doing what they used to do, which is they used to hear from each individual department themselves and they collated the budget and came up with the final budget. So with, with the switch to a town administrator, part of that role has shifted to myself and who we have for a finance director. Um, so that's, to me, that makes sense, but maybe it doesn't make sense to you. Um, and that's pretty much all I have in terms of what I wanted to say. So what I would say is just please don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. There are sections here you may be incredibly opposed to, and that's fine, but there's a bunch of things that are just governance changes that make sense to be adopted. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you.
ask a question about the $50,000 lease option plan. Yeah. Sure. How did that come up? That seems like I get you. We don't have to have one down to get a low lease. But $50,000 is kind of a high high payment to me. What would be a good example of that? What page are you on? This is about three or four feet. A five-year piece of equipment from Public Works, from a small piece of equipment from Public Works, then being leased over a five-year term would represent a $50,000 item that still has to go to budget. And you have to realize that that $50,000 is if we call, we, we, we would have to call, and just like we did with the mower that just went up in front of the town meeting, we would have to call a special town meeting to have a vote on a piece of equipment that would be fifty thousand dollars, and right now I think Eric, what's it, five thousand dollars or two thousand dollars? No, there's actually no limit. Right? There's no limit. So any of this. So it, it, it's it's not it's not something that's included in the normal budget because you would get to vote on that, you know, at referendum and be able to speak about it. It's if we if the board of selectmen called a special meeting on a, a lease that they wanted to enact. It's outside the budget for fifty thousand dollars. It technically is not really going to occur very often, but it's just setting a different threshold. So I'm just curious. Okay. Marcy, you're I just have a question, Marcy Minor West Street. What is the process for when uh, the town clerk wants to leave her position, or um, say we hire a new one and find that maybe the townspeople aren't happy with the new person, what would be the process of that person going? Well, right now we can't, uh, because the town clerk is an elected official, and the town clerk is statutorily required, you know, has rules, there are rules. Of, the local government can't just go after the town clerk and ask the town clerk to leave. The town clerk could resign. And that's a whole other issue I don't ever want to deal with. You know, well, that's please, please let me go before that happens. Right. Because I don't know what we would do in Arizona. We'd have to have a special election. Well, We'd have a special election, and then anyone in town who the Democratic Town Committee and the Republican Town Committee approved would run off for the, the town clerk's position. That's what we're doing. And that, that could be challenging. And then, Jeff, that's whether they're qualified or not. That's, that's a a whether they're qualified or not. That's right. just a political arena. There's no qualifications to that. I mean, listen, the town clerk's position for everybody that's going, it is no different than what we did with the town administrator in replacing the first selectman's uh, you know, uh, administrative authority. Because you can never be guaranteed that the person sitting in the first selectman's chair has the capabilities to do that job effectively for the town's residents. That's why we did it. So you all voted for that. There's no difference in the town clerk's position than the town administrator's position. Mm -hmm. so right. mm -hmm. Is it? Not necessarily. I disagree with that. You can sit there and say you want somebody to vote for, it, but Catherine, think of the Democratic Town Committee. Who are you putting up for that job that's qualified to do that job effectively for the residents of the town of Aaron? Not the 50 people that are here at this meeting, but the other 2,500 residents that need the town clerk services. Who is the Democratic town committee putting up for that job? You got any well, ideas? Here's my question though. But this is, to answer that is you're talking a political versus profession. So that's what I had asked, or what I had said before when somebody was saying something that currently she is in an elected position, but she has an autonomy there because she doesn't answer directly to the town administrator or anyone else. If, I, if you now uh, appoint her, if you now hire someone, that person, of course, has no autonomy. That person is going to answer, politically speaking, I'm just not, professionally it's different, but the town, little town politics is little town politics, and that's not going to change. So that position is no longer autonomous. That position is now going to be involved in the political process of the town administrator in the town. Eric Anderson, on one side, Eric Anderson's position is a political position, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it's, it's appointed by the board every, year, every two years, not every right. four years, every two years, we have to renew Eric's contract. This board 
could sit there and say they want Eric out. Right. Right? And we could we could vote him out okay. and then have to hire and politically do it a new mm -hmm. why. Who wants to go through this? Eric, don't ever leave. <laughs> right? <laughs> You're doing a great job for the screen. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Yeah. Don't forget, we're not talking about Carol. We're talking right. about the town clerk. That's right. right. Carol's not gonna, right. you know, she's not gonna want to be the town clerk forever. Yeah. We're gonna have to have another new person. And I feel like we've gotten lucky having Carol, and we might not get lucky having someone in town that is like her. Right. I was going to say the same thing. I feel like you know we had some positions in the town office that were very difficult to fill. We hired people that didn't work out. If they were elected, we would have had a Jim Dandy of a time getting rid of them. Mm -hmm. When the person is appointed, there's qualifications and expectations that come along that they have to meet. That if they don't meet them, we can move on to the correct person in the job. And you gotta take Carol Lee out of it. You gotta look at the position and what's best to move the town forward and keep things going. The new town clerk, whoever he or she may be, has state regulations and laws that they will have to adhere to, as Eric had mentioned, but they should be an appointed position and not an elected political position based on qualifications. Right. Is there anyone who has not spoken that would like to speak one time? Eric? And, and Louise, is there anyone else that has not spoken that wants to talk? Come on, Eric, you're up. You're up. Louise is going to go next. Anybody else? I want you on the record right now. Anybody? Anybody? All right, Louise, you get the last word, all right? <laughs> Eric Shevchenko, Plumpery Hall Road. It's a lot of Still Eric Shevchenko. <laughs> and I still live on Plumpery Hall Road. I served on the Ram Board of Ed. And one of our most difficult assignments was to hire a new superintendent for that school. That is a big, big position. It's huge for the future of that school. We, have a, we had a board of 11 people and we spent literally months working on this issue, getting it down from 11 terrific applicants to six. And now how are we going to get it to three? And now how are we going to get it to a point where we can have a vote on this, right? So the effort that we put into that to, to select the best possible candidate is a, a, a great multiple on what would happen if it was simply a vote. If a bunch of people just applied and there was a list to vote, how are people going to know who the most qualified person is, right? So, you know, so with uh, people on boards, our wonderful board here that works hard for us, we have a we have a democratic vote. I agree with that, right? But when you're when you're hiring a professional, and it seems to me that Carol Lee is a professional, that we need to have a group of people look deeply into the people who are applying for this job and, and use their collective judgment in selecting the best person. And so you say, well, how would, why did I get that? Why, why did I deserve that responsibility? It's because you put me there. That's how it works. So, you know, I, I'm just trying to speak in, in support of uh, appointing a person here where um, you're able to look deeply into uh, who is applied and, and have a, a good group of people make uh, a selection on behalf of the townspeople who voted them into that decision to do that.
Thank you. We're adjourning the public hearing. Everybody voted? This is the town meeting. Vote for the first um, uh, the agenda, the first item is uh, call to order, which we're doing. Second item is public speak. Anyone? <laughs> I'm going to go real quick. Anyone? Don't you think that, huh? Okay. okay. Um, three, discussion and possible action on the draft charter report. So, um, uh, what I would like to do is. Um, I'll, 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 I'll go first for the board of selectmen. Um, I was also on the Charter Revision Commission, um, and I just want to express what was done so everybody understands. Um, the majority of these items that are done are not what I want to have done. I, I had a different agenda uh, knowing that we needed to move the Charter Revision Committee to get on the November election ballot so that we have the majority of the town residents to come and would vote, yes or no. Because in my mind, um, when we do these types of things, it's, it's appropriate to go to a referendum and to have the greatest number of residents that can vote on a, a subject that's going to impact the entire town. It's very important because the town meeting, while it's great, it's 50 people who really do, and I agree with Mr. and Mrs. Hutchinson, uh, and, and when she says it, those are the people who are committed to come to the town meetings. But, we have a, a town of 2,500 residents uh, and voters that we sit there and have to move. Now, when I want, what I wanted done was a town council form of government. The Charter Revision Committee chose not to take that up, which I was, I'm okay with. I do believe there would be a better form of governing the town where you take a seven member board, combine the Board of Finance and the Board of Selectmen, and you allow one board who hopefully you get seven good committed people to sit there and deal with the finances and the, uh, the direction of the community. That's what I wanted to do. That got taken off the table. Now, what we did and what happened is, as Eric well positioned these, he's like, we, and these would be the questions on the ballot that, that would go in some manner. I'm not detail, I'm just giving you generalizations. November elections make sense. You know, we need to be in November elections. The town clerk moving from elected to appointed makes sense. We could vote yes or no on that. Ordinances, slightly more confrontational, more that it's giving the board that you elected and the, the, the position within town to create ordinances. And then we worked as a committee and bent over backwards to try to make the petitioning process as easy as possible for the for the residents. And we we didn't, you know, the whole goal ended up being efficiency so that we wouldn't redo things and we wouldn't call out community members to come to meetings over and over and over again. Because we as a board could sit there and say we want a special meeting all the time. And we're dragging you out all the time. That's not what we want. You guys don't want to come to these meetings all the time. So we attempted, we were attempting to try to get these to push into a referendum at the two major elections. Now, one thing I will agree with Mrs. Hutchinson, the older Mrs. Hutchinson, 10%, I can, I can live with taking that out. I can tell the rest of the board, I can live with taking 10% out of the elected number because you should always have more than 10% because we're consolidating the budget votes. That's what also one of the functional things we do is consolidating the budget votes so that both budgets are voting on at the same time. You should get more than 200 people at that election. But if you don't, and there's, a, there's an ordinance on it, fine. Up or down 50%, yes or no, I get it. So I would agree with that, that point. The financial thresholds, which is the, the other item, we're running them at the town with a, an operating budget of two, two Four million dollars, and if you look at the town, it's four million dollars for the town, four million dollars for AES, and four million dollars for rent. 
the thresholds are extremely low and they call for town meetings to be called when we don't hit those thresholds. So we're just bumping them up slightly, right? We're not taking any of the financial issues away from the town meeting, we still having a town meeting. The only thing that we're dealing with is as soon as the town meeting is over and the town meeting votes to either lower a line or a, a, a total budget, that budget goes right to the referendum for the rest of the community to vote on. So that was that part of it. And then there's just minor language issues, as Eric was talking about, that are in the charter <coughs> that really need to be fixed. <coughs> so that's why, we, that's why it was done, why the Charter Revision Commission did it. And I'll actually tell you that that was the first Charter Revision Commission I was on. Uh, I thought it was incredibly well run. Bob Hamburg did a great job. Carol Lee was on it. So anyone who sits there and says that the town clerk issue didn't get addressed by the town clerk, she may not vote for it, but that's why we do these processes, to give an opportunity for yes or no. Just like the last charter revision, I was a no vote. I lost. I didn't want the bifurcation of the budget because I think it creates, it creates problems within the community. It's an us versus them with the Board of Education. I didn't want that. And I even voted to send it to referendum because that's what it's about. You send things to referendum and you let the community vote on it. So if the community of Andover wants to vote and votes on it by bifurcation of the budget, then so be it. It wasn't what I wanted. And that's how I think these things should work. I just think it should go forward and, and be done. And, and you want to vote no on a topic? Vote no. You want to go on campaign to vote on the topic? Go out and campaign for it. I'm okay with that. And I'll live with results. But I think it's being done for efficiency. The, the, this whole power grab thing, do you think anyone on this board is up here because they have power? None of us work for this community. None of us sit there and get paid. None of us sit there and get a thrill on having power for something overall in this time. Let me tell you, that was ended when Eric stepped into the town administration. So as far as I'm concerned, it's about efficiency and it's about getting the most voice out of the most people so that they can vote things up or down appropriately. Next, Jeff, you wanna? Uh, just, just to mention the ordinances. I mean, the only ordinances we pass are ordinances that we get emails about and suggestions to do. Like one of the things we're working on right now is the dog issue at the ball fence. People are running their dog. And the dogs are defecating on the ball fence. And people are emailing us wanting an ordinance. You know, to something with teeth that we can go after these dog owners that are letting their dogs run on the ball fence. So we're not going to propose anything that's people don't want. And we're proposing what people email us and tell us what they want to do. And those are the things that we're trying to do. So and um, my thought after listening to everybody today is that I can see the ordinances going to the referendum, but I would think maybe we should have, if we want to put forward an ordinance, anything for the six months up to an election or a you know, referendum, we send them all to that referendum and have the townspeople vote on all of them instead of having to go through this petition. That's my thought. Scott? All these things that uh, we've been talking about tonight are all things that we've been through. You know, since we've been all on boards and the boards previous to this, all these are problems that we've come up with over the years that are finally getting straightened out. So that, that's why they're all, it's not some conspiracy, it's, it's nothing to hurt anybody. Nobody here wants that. We all want to straighten things out to make the town move smoothly. That's all we want here. And I think they did a good job at it. It's a lot of, you know, up and down. You gotta figure it all out. But we all did it for the betterment of the town. Paul? Uh, I think you all said what I was thinking. Actually, Jeff Murray brought up a good point about the ordinance. Because we, yeah. you know, we're, we're reading the Facebook posts, we're, we're reading the emails, we're, we're listening to our neighbors. Um, we live in town too, so we, we don't want to pass something that's going to you know affect us negatively too. So um, I think Jeff just 
really summarize that. I mean, we've gone to meetings, people have told us, you know, like the thing about the ball fans, we've seen the Facebook posts, we've seen the emails, and it's just, people want us to do something, that's what we're gonna do. I mean, we haven't heard anything that people want to run their dogs in the ball field, it's just that people are looking for dogs just run well down there. It's I'm down there every day, getting people off that ball field. Every day. And it's the same people all the time, with yeah. eight signs around the field. Yeah. All we want to do is get some teeth to put the minor ordinance and define the fine procedure for people doing, you know, going against the ordinance and bringing their dogs on the ball field. And we've got kids playing. We don't even want our kids running in. Files a dog. He's, he's, you know. in, in, in this case, there will be no minor or major order. It'll just be an ordinance. That's all we're trying to get to at this point. It's put an ordinance for it. And I honestly believe that we went well outside of the normal scope of trying to allow people to petition for an ordinance to sit there and, and get that ordinance on a ballot. So I, I just sit there and I go, the petition process is in place. And I'm sorry, I, maybe I'm just, it's 50 signatures. If I felt strongly that a future board of selectmen did something that I, absolutely disagreed with, I would be going to every one of you in this room and I would be saying, please sign this paper so it can go on the ballot. And it, it's, not, it's not that hard, I'm sorry. Even if I don't want to vote yes or no, it can go on the ballot. And you could do that with every ordinance we put forward. You can get 50 signatures and it's gonna go on the ballot. Well, unless you believe that, hey, it's a reasonably good ordinance. Can I, can I ask the question? Okay. So these are uh, this is an obvious answer. How many board select members were on that committee? I was the only one. Okay. So the rest of the committee talked about the petition process and felt like it was a good thing to move forward to tonight. I'm just stating the obvious. They all voted for it. I mean, and and what we did is, and Shannon listened to that one meeting because I was the one in, in charge of the ordinance section. There were, every other member had a different section. It wasn't like we sat there and Jeff McGuire drove the entire issue. It was, everybody had an issue. Somebody had, you know, the, the November election. Somebody had the town clerk. Somebody had the financial ramifications of the thing. And each member, he did it. He did a really good job. Did a very good job of doing it. My job was to sit there going. And I went with everybody who had an issue as to, okay, if we do a petition, how would it work? And we extended the petition from 20 days to 45 days to 20 days within the 45 days until the mailer was received by the entire community outlining the ordinance. We were incredibly detailed. And, and to be really honest, Tom Chung said I was crazy because he's like, it's only 20 days. I said, no, I said it's the process that everybody has a chance to sit there and get 50 signatures. You can't get 50 signatures in 20 days. I am sorry. Our, our democracy is dumb. So. Um, just, I was looking here at 301. It says the, um, including but not listen to the authority to approve and enact, repeal and modify all ordinances after a public hearing, and also those powers in the written form to. So we would discuss an ordinance and then post that we're having a public hearing the next month and so that people can come and express their opinion so you know whether or not it's going to be a no for most people or a possible okay. That's pretty okay. much required in the state of law that you have a public hearing before you enact an ordinance. You could probably do it in a charter and get rid of the public hearing. Nobody does. Everybody does. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. natural. And, and Ann, just so you, you're clear, and everybody else is clear, we do that. The ordinance does not take effect to 45 days. So the way I envision this is the Board of Selectmen has a meeting. That's 30 days later, we have a second meeting. So we're going to get feedback from a public hearing. We're going to get feedback at our second Board of Selectmen meeting. We don't have to put anything up. The Board of Selectmen can say no at any time to any ordinance that it wants. And the Board of Selectmen has the authority to repeal any ordinance at any time. It, it's not as if we're taking anything away from the public. You've elected us to do a job. We're sitting there trying to do the best job that we can. And then if you don't like what we're doing, well, you vote us out. But if you don't like what we're doing on an ordinance, 
You get 20, 50 signatures, it goes on the ballot, and the entire town votes. It's simple. I'm just breaking it down simply, but that's what it, this is about. So, and in the interim, it doesn't go into effect. Yeah, it does not go into effect. And I believe um, somebody said that that signature that didn't count, there's a special form you have to get from the town clerk. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. The town clerk has the. And we have to have a special form and make sure it's all. And, and, we, we, and we talked about that within the mailer that needs to go out to the community to sit there and have on the mailer explanations of the petitioning process and what they need to do. The petition, a valid petition would be in the town clerk's office. It needs to be sat there and set up and you go forward and do it. But I'm sorry, 50 signatures. Hmm. Not, I, I mean, not, it's just me, but 50 signatures. Exactly. You'll get. You'll get. You can send it to the transfer oh, station, get, yeah. and you can get 50 signatures in now. So yeah. register voters. That's good. So Wait a minute. anyway, so we yeah, right. So, um, yeah, right. so anyway, anybody else on the board of selectmen want to talk about any of the specific issues that are raised? I I have a I have a question, but go ahead. Uh, Let's go. So yeah, it was brought up tonight that there was a section missing. Um, there's sections deleted all over the place in that chart. Right, so I guess my general question is if we want to move forward with this and we, we need to fix, if we decide to fix that, how do we handle that tonight? Well, the only thing that we would be doing tonight is voting on the draft from the charter you know, committee. And then what would happen is we would then create questions that would have to be submitted to the Secretary of State's office that would go on the ballot, so yes or no. So everybody would have the right to vote yes or vote no on any specific topic that is addressed. There'll probably be the six or six seven, or seven yeah. that would end up being on the chart. Like the ordinance one would be one. If you don't want the ordinance one to go into effect, you vote no. If you want November elections to be there, you vote yes. I mean, you know. Well, the well, order is that you, you don't have to vote on that. Exactly, you can change here to see this. We can sit there and refer anything back to the Charter Revision Commission if we choose to. Yep. So that's what the board has the power to do. We either have the power to accept it in its entirety or push a portion of it back to the Charter Revision Commission because we believe it's a good idea. If you do that, you'll have to do it pretty soon if you want to make the deadline in order to get it on the ballot. But you can't, you have enough time. Because you would have to get, I would say, your next meeting, I believe on the 11th, your next regular meeting, you would have to do that at that meeting, have a, a joint meeting with the Charter Revision Commission and uh, discuss your differences because this is their proposal. Do we have to have, uh, well, like, let's do the logistics. So let's sit there and say, Mrs. Hutchinson's 10% was on a move. What do we need to do? You would have to meet with the Charter Revision Commission at your next, invite them to your next board of Select the meeting, have a joint meeting with them, and try to come to an agreement on that. And that probably wouldn't be too difficult. But, uh, you know, if, you, if that's the only question you have, it wouldn't be too difficult at all, I don't think. So we would have to have a special charge of revision commission before the board is there. No, you can, we did it that way last time, to last two, about two years ago. All right, and same thing, same process. No requirement to come back to this group and do this all over again. No. Okay. Then, no, he, then, no, the law only requires a one public hearing. Okay. It's a board of All right, then, then uh, I would like to make a motion to uh, accept all the charter, the draft report in its entirety, with the exception of eliminating the 10% voting requirement for uh, uh, referendums. I'll start with that. Discussion on anything else? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, so just so everybody here understands, the questions will be drafted, right? After we get back to the Charter Revision Commission on the 10%, questions will be drafted. They'll be available for everybody to understand, and then you can campaign, yes or no, up or down, related to all these items. Will they put on the website? They will. Yeah. They'll be ready before the meeting on the 11th. Okay. They'll be ready. Now, what about the definition of minor versus not just ordinances? 
Because right now we may, we may change that in accordance with one of the sections that will be uh, minor language changes because that'll be an up or down and those minor language changes will be a little bit more detailed that you probably well, that impacts that, that section okay. impacts the uh, the issue of the order uh, of how we do ordinances so right. it is included in that <clears throat> we, we say something about that Kathy, and it's gone I realized I'm, I'm as obsessive compulsive as anybody believe me and I realized that that's a definition section. Okay. It's no longer a definition if minor ordinance is taken out of there. That's, to, but, to, but to insist that it, that it not stay there in the way it's written is being overly obsessive compulsive. Because sooner or later that will disappear from the charter and it will only be a matter of history. All the town clerk's office has every charter that's ever been done right. in there. You can, the history, it's important to preserve the history but I, I think the best way to address that issue of minor ordinances is the way that it's written. Even though it's not a definition anymore, it was, and it's just being removed. So it's telling you what's being done with it. So you're saying it'll just say, wherever it says minor, we'll just say ordinance. That's right. Okay. There'll be, because the question, Catherine, of deciding what is a minor ordinance and what is not, okay. Okay. What it comes down to is it's so generally stated that it comes down to me because I'm the town attorney and I say, okay, I think it's mine, all right? I'd rather not do that. Uh, I'd rather just have ordinances and have them all acted on the same as any other words. It usually comes down to money and fines. Yeah. I mean, there are some that are obviously uh, minor, but sometimes it's a close call. Okay. Uh, anyone else have anything before we move on? Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, item four, public speak. Anyone else? Excuse me? Did you take a vote tonight? We need a spot now. Marcy. Uh, one thing uh, is, I got to admit that the, um, the thought of getting signatures, even if it's 50, it may seem like it's not a lot, but I'm sitting here thinking, if I got to get 50 signatures, that's going to take a lot, because I could take an hour and talk to four people, you know? so. If there's a way to make that easier, maybe even online, an online, you know, uh, something on the website, I don't know, question, I, I don't know, just something that's easier. Understood. Julia. Um, Erica talked about um, certain items. He mentioned sections 304G and 702G, the use of term reasonable governance. Seemed to make a lot of sense to me that the kind of thing he was talking about um, should be included in whatever you come back to get or voting on. Yes, and uh, you all know what it was going to So, so just so you understand, you want sure questions. I know what questions are, but you mentioned. You want the questions written in such a way to approach what Eric told us. Well, and to include what he suggested as... They're all in it. All right. Uh, yeah, well, that's right. Because that's where it's the question will be written in more general terms, but yeah. we'll make sure that, uh, Julia, that it encompasses all of those, all those issues about thresholds. Sure. Yeah, yeah so, but you think there might be a question from Thank you. Well, sure. oh, Scott, I pointed out to the commission just a bunch of things, minor changes that you said that need to be made to make the charter um, flow better. Well, not just that, to comport with its actual language. It refers to um, provisions that don't exist anymore and whatnot. How might those be addressed? Would they be put to a question, or it probably would be better if the Board of Selectmen, pa I don't know, passing on those so that they don't even have to be addressed? It's, well, there are as many if they can be handled. Uh, By the board's selected, right? Yeah. Okay, great. We'll sit there and tell you about those, right? Sharon, in, yes, my, in my mind, there's, there's one question that's a minor language question. Yep. And that would fall in under the minor language. Thank you. Um, just, I, I can't speak for Don that way, and I certainly don't want to. But <laughs> from my perspective, Power Grab was not individual. It was an institutional thing. It's saying that the board of selectors, as an institution, is taking uh, authority that is now in the town meeting. No, it's not meant at all personally to anyone here. I took it personally. <laughs> I know that. Me too. I would just like to comment that the term minor ordinance was used initially 
it would appear that that was an intention not to include all ordinances. The removal of the word minor will not include all ordinances. Thank you. Anyone else? Fine. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. All right. Thank you very much.